Tonight, Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13, 14, and 15, just these three verses we'll begin with tonight. So let's read all three verses together here tonight. Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13, 14, and 15. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word that we hold in our hands. Lord, help us, Lord, not to take it for granted, Lord, but to love it and to Lord, read it and live it, study it, memorize it, just to, um, Lord, meet needs in our hearts and lives tonight. And as the song said, we pray, Lord, you illumine us, open our eyes, Lord, our ears tonight, that we might hear what you have for us and fill our preacher with your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we've been going through this wonderful, blessed book, the book of Isaiah, a lot of things are quoted from Isaiah, many famous verses, two of my very favorite verses in the whole world come from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> I have, <clears throat> with friends and who have gone through difficult times, uh, in my phone, which we're recording on right now, there's a tool called text replacement. Probably every smartphone in the world has that. And what it is, is if you put in a certain code or a number of letters of some kind, uh, it will pull up whatever you've put in. Like rather than uh, saying, uh, God bless you, which my little fat thumbs have a hard time doing, I put GB. And when I do GB in space, it brings up God bless you and it sends it. And when somebody has a birthday, uh, I... Rather than using my fat little thumbs to do happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, I put HB and replace it with the entire text of happy birthday to you. I do HB and space, and then it's inserted. I do the same thing with the plan of salvation. I have each of those. If I, For example, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, I don't have to type it out. I just put 5, 8, space, and it puts it in. And it's also a bother because so many things have five, eight in them that when I'm typing something, it'll end up throwing a Bible verse in when I've got it there. But I'll take it. I really will. Well, two of my favorite verses are Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. And they say, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Well, <laughs> My little fat little thumbs don't do real well on that. And so I, uh, I put in 2634 space, and it brings it up and pastes it in. For thank you, I put TY space, and again it says thank you. Uh, different things. Uh, Manitou Springs is MS space, and then it pipes out Manitou Springs. Uh, by the way is uh, BTW, and it puts in by the way comma. And I like that because it helps me to do things. Well, to Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Can't tell you how many people over the years I have sent that to whose hearts were broken for one reason or another. All that from the book of Isaiah. One of the most famous verses in the book of Isaiah, Brother Penn read with us a moment ago, and you all recognized it right away. And we will come to that in a moment. And last week we had the chosen seed. And what I want to do, because Isaiah shares the Lord's encouragement to his faithful people and calls Israel to be ready uh, for the coming of the Lord. And of course, the prophet, that he gave them the word of God. He gave them what God wanted him to prophesy. And this portion of Isaiah is going to be in multiple sections. And the first was what I'm going to review with you right now, just for a moment. And that was the chosen seed. And Isaiah continues his prophecy of God's dealing with the nation of Israel. And so, as you know, those are God's chosen people. And I'm just going to say this tonight, not to get in a fist fight with anybody online, but Christians are not New Testament Jews. I'm sorry. It's just that replacement theology is a bunch of hooey. I used that word this morning, didn't I? I got to look up hooey one of these days. And uh, that's a false teaching. 
You read in the book of Isaiah little little words like everlasting and eternal and uh, forever and things like that where God calls them his people. He doesn't get rid of his people, no, and he doesn't replace them with Christians. We are not modern day Jews. And I hate the term, even though many years ago I used to say it, but I don't say it anymore except in illustration. They say, well, uh, I've got an older brother who's a Jew. That's Mormon theology even though it may be true to a point because Jesus is God's son and I am one of God's sons. I don't use that Mormon theology with anyone anymore. And so I don't think it's right to do. And so we we understand that God loves his chosen people. He chose them for a reason. And I want to say again, he did not choose the Jews for salvation. He chose the Jews for his divine purpose as a nation. And by the way, no one is chosen for salvation as is taught by many false teachers today. No, we are given the opportunity to receive Christ as our Savior. As the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let him take the water of life freely, the word of God says. So we are given that opportunity, but no, we're not chosen for that. The Bible says of the Lord Jesus, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It goes on to say that he gave his life a ransom for many. And in another place, it says he gave his life a ransom for all. And he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So fooey on this stuff about Christians being modern day God's chosen people. That smacks of Calvinism. And I am more Catholic than I am Calvinist. And I am not Catholic at all. Now, I've got that off my chest. I feel much better. I hope you feel much better as well. So what we learned about this was simply we learned about, uh, we, we learned these facts about Israel. And then in Isaiah 51, verses 1 and 2, we learned that God reminded the Israelites that they are descendants of Abraham and Sarah. And then there was a promise that was made in Isaiah 51, verses 3 through 8. And these verses refer to the coming millennium, uh, at which time God promises to destroy Israel's enemies and uh, to rule over the nations. And then there was a prayer that was offered in Isaiah 51, verses 9 through 11. It says, by faith, Israel calls upon God. I love this. They call upon God to do what he said he would do. I mentioned this last week, and I'm just going to make it another statement this week. Have you ever gone to your prayer closet and reminded God of what he has said? One might say that's sacrilegious. It is not at all. Israel now reminds God of what God has promised. I have gone to God many times in my prayer, and I say, Lord, don't you remember what you wrote in such and such? Don't you remember? remember, I want to recall to your memory, God, what you said in this passage of Scripture, and I will say that. You say, well, Pastor, doesn't he remember his word? Yeah, I don't always remember his word, but I just, I say to the Lord, this is what you promised. This is something you've said, and I'm going to hold you to it, and I say that to the Lord, and I say it reverently. And then, of course, there was protection that was offered from the Lord himself as they said, now, Lord, this is what you promised in Isaiah 51, verses 11 through 16. We find here, uh, excuse me, 12 through 16, that the Lord personally assured is the Israelites that he is going to protect them. He said, I will protect you. And then, of course, Jerusalem then receives some wake up calls. You know what a wake-up call, that's something that gets your attention. And now Israel gets two wake-up calls. And the first one that we looked at was regarding God's punishment. And the punishment has to do with transferring the cup of God's wrath from Israel to Israel's enemies. Let me say it again. A transferal of God's wrath and punishment from Israel, which they had already experienced, lots of it because of their rebellion, because of their sin, because of turning their backs on God. They turned their back on God, but God never turned his back on them. I read the verse in the New Testament says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And uh, to backsliders, I have often said, the Bible says, if you draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Which one of you moved? Which one of you moved? 
And so it certainly wasn't God. He promised to draw nigh to us. And then, of course, there was the first call. Uh, there was the first wake up call regarding God's punishment. He says, all right, you've been through that punishment. Now it's going to go to your enemies. And there was a second wake up call regarding God's power where God reminded them of his power. You know, we use the terminology omnipotent. That means all powerful. Omniscient obviously means all knowledgeable. Omnipotent speaks of his his all power, and he reminds them of that. And you know, every now and then, God's people need to be reminded that God is omnipotent, and he is not limited, and he is all powerful. And uh, we sing the song, uh, uh, God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. And we sing that, but often God's people don't believe that. And they have to be reminded just ever so often that there is a God in heaven who is all powerful and there's nothing that he cannot do. And he will never do anything outside of his will, which means we need to be in tune with the will of God. And let me just ask the question, where do we find the will of God? We find the will of God in the word of God. That's where we find the written word of God. And so then, of course, there was the uh, preaching that went on after that in Isaiah chapter 52, uh, verses 7 through 10. We learned this last week, and this week we're going back to Isaiah 52. Uh, Israel is to shout the glorious news of God's salvation. That's what they were supposed to do. And that's where we learned about how the gospel in wording in English here is mentioned there about spreading the glad tidings and the good news. And of course, Israel was to do that. And that's why many people share testimonies when God does something wonderful for them. And by the way, getting up in the morning and breathing, uh, sleeping at night, walking on, all, I almost said walking on all fours. <laughs> You don't walk on all fours. You know, walking in the morning or whatever it might be, safety throughout the day. We have lots of things to testify of. And I'm so tired of believers saying, I don't have anything to testify about. You're breathing. You've got something to testify about. If you're born again, you've got something to testify about. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And we can. Well, here God promises Israel their redemption. And he says, now it's your turn to stand on the mountain and shout it out so that the world knows what God can do. And so that's what we studied last week in a nutshell. Now, this portion tonight of Isaiah is uh, I, that we started with. I said it was in multiple sections. The first section was, as I gave it to you, the chosen seed. But the second section is the chosen servant, the chosen servant. And here Isaiah presents the entire work. I love this. <laughs> he presents the entire work of our Savior in a little teeny tiny capsule. You've heard the phrase about John 3.16. What do they say it is? Gospel in a what? A gospel in a nutshell. Well, it absolutely is the gospel in a nutshell. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel in a nutshell. And I want to say this, there is enough saving power in John 3.16 to save the entire world. They don't need Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9-13. They don't need that. All they need is John 3.16, and that's enough to save anybody, no matter who they are. Uh, and uh, no problem with understanding that. Well, here we have the ministry of the Lord Jesus in a little capsulated form, okay? And I want you to see this tonight. First of all, notice the, his earthly ministry. Chapter 52, verse 13. And the very first part of the verse is what I want to give you on that. And I'm not one that is prone to put 13A and 13B and 13. I'm not one that is prone to do that, though a lot of people do that, but I'm going to give you the A and the B tonight. Isaiah 52, 13A, he says, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. And that word prudently means this. It's very interesting. And you're going to want to write it down because you probably in your mind have another meaning for the word prudent or prudently. The way that is, is used here, it means to prosper and to have success. 
and he says, my servant is going to be successful. And let me tell you what, <laughs> he was very successful. When he, I'm sure the devil thought he won when Jesus was crucified on Calvary. I'm sure the devil thought that he won the battle. Why? Because they took the Savior and they beat him with a cat of nine tails. They imprisoned him. They, they took him up and they crucified him on a cross. And I'm sure, as the songwriter said many years ago, even though, even though it's not necessarily written in the Bible, talked about the devil's victory and how the demons dined and shouted for glory and all the rest of it. I'm sure he thought he won <laughs> until three days later when our Savior came out of that tomb alive and well, and he lost. And Jesus is the one who prospered and he is the one who did what was right. He is the one who had success. Oh, the devil thought he won, uh, but he didn't win. That's for sure. So his earthly ministry is a prosperous ministry. Notice next is that his crucifixion is mentioned here. And this is the verse that all of us are more familiar with. And we understand this chapter 52 and verse 14. I want you to notice this. As many were astonied at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. The way that we have had this taught to us and what we have said and uh, the goth crowd loves this verse more than they love any verse in the plan of salvation because it's talking, we talk about how Jesus was beaten and how the Bible teaches that he was not recognizable even as a man. He was beaten so awful. And so the description here is he is beaten and bloody and disfigured because of what they did. They took rods and hit him on top of the head. They put a crown of thorns upon his head, but they didn't just put it there. They platted it on the Bible says they took, they took a rod and beat it onto his skull. You notice here in the front of the pulpit, you see those thorns. Those are from Israel. Those are the kind of thorns that were used to crown, make a crown of thorns for the Lord Jesus. I, I had, now Robin does the decorations, as you know. And every time I have picked up that crown of thorns, I've gotten stuck with it. And I, I'm very, very careful. But I tell you what, I hurt for a long time after I get stuck with one of those thorns. Big old long thorns, sharp as needles or more so. And those thorns were, were platted onto Jesus' head. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails, 39 stripes. And Josephus, the Old Testament theologian, the, uh, who was not a believer, but he knew history. He simply said that someone who was beaten with a cat of nine tails was often, because it was 39 stripes, it'd be 13 down one side of the body, 13 down another side of the body, and 13 across the midsection of the body. And Josephus said often, one beaten with a cat of nine tails was disemboweled because it literally would almost cut him in half. That's what this verse is describing. No, Jesus was not disemboweled, but Jesus was beaten thoroughly with a cat of nine tails. In the Bible, did you notice what it said here? The word stony. you're wondering what that word means, aren't you? Why don't you look at it? And if you're right in your Bibles, it won't hurt you to put it down there. It means they were horrified. They were absolutely appalled when they saw him. Can you imagine what Jesus' mother must have gone through when she saw her son after he had been beaten with a cat of nine tails, after he had been beaten with rods, after they had taken literally the palms of their hands? I learned this as someone who knew karate taught me. When they hit somebody with their fist like this, they hit with these two knuckles right here because that's straight onto the bone like that. Well, they took Jesus and they didn't have karate back in those days, at least we don't know that they did. They took the palms of their hands and they hit him with the palms of theirs. Now look at the line between your palm and your elbow. It's a solid bone, not a solid bone, but a solid path. And they hit Jesus with the palms of their hands. They beat him with sticks. Then the people were horrified. They were astonished. They were literally appalled at what they saw. Now, why did Jesus do that? Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Amazing what our Savior went through. All that to please the Father because it said it pleased God 
when he saw the travail of his own son, Isaiah chapter 53. And that's the chapter that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading as he traveled from Jerusalem, uh, from Ethiopia all the way up to Jerusalem on that day. An unsaved man uh, reading the scroll of Isaiah, reading the very chapter of Isaiah chapter 53, and he still didn't understand how to be saved. And Philip attached himself to the chariot and uh, and he said, what you reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, well, I don't have any idea. Is this man talking about himself or someone else? And the Bible says that Philip explained to him that that was Jesus. And on that day, that Ethiopian fellow ended up trusting Jesus Christ. He went to Jerusalem, not as a religious man. He went to Jerusalem as a saved man. And he got baptized right after he got saved. Uh, oh, how good our Savior is. But then I want you to look at this. Not only that, but we have the earthly ministry of Christ, which was he was successful and prosperous. We have the crucifixion of Christ, which is how he gave his life a ransom for all. <clears throat> but then look at chapter 52, verse 13, and the last part, 13b. It speaks of his resurrection. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. He is highly exalted. Now, you don't exalt a dead man. He gave his life and was resurrected. So what do we have here? We sort of have what you call the gospel, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. But then the next part of his ministry that I said will be encapsulated is chapter 52 and verse 15, <clears throat> where we have uh, his redemption. Jesus brought redemption to a lost and dying world. Verse 15 it says, so shall he sprinkle many, many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now I want you to look at the word sprinkle. When we look at the word sprinkle, we think of sprinkles on donuts. We think about rain sprinkling. We think of all these different pictures in our mind of that. But the word that God used here is a picture word. That's, uh, and I love it when God puts in the Bible a word that draws a picture in our minds. And that word that he put here, it means literally to startle, but it also means to leap, to jump. So that meaning is all found in that little word. And he says, so shall he cause to leap or startle many nations. Why? Because he's no longer dead. He's the savior of the world. And so we have that meaning that God gave to us. It says he will startle, he will cause to leap uh, many nations and the king shall shut their mouths at him for that which he had not had, which had not been told them, shall they see and that which they had not heard, shall they consider. And he startles the nations. Amazing thing. Uh, I wonder what it was like on that day of the Savior's resurrection. Well, we do know that when he was crucified in the general area there that the graves were opened and a lot of dead people came out and went back home. I don't know that I wanted to see that. Didn't we bury him last week? <laughs> What's he doing knocking at the door? And, uh, and, and wasn't she dead and all the rest of it? Uh, that would have been an amazing thing to see. But those who had put him to death that saw him above 500 people at one point saw him alive. And Jesus is alive today. He that being dead dieth no more, and death hath no more dominion over him. Romans chapter 6 and verse 9. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. And that song, by the way, was written by a man who had listened to a radio preacher that denied the resurrection of Christ. And he says, no, he's not dead. He lives. And the song was born out of that moment in that man's life. But here I am reminded of this. I'm reminded of the purpose for which Christ came. You ought to mark these verses in your Bible. You probably already have them marked and possibly even have them memorized. I don't know. I've not asked and I'm not going to ask. 
But I'm reminded in this little short encapsulated picture of the ministry of Christ on this earth, just like John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell. Here, these few verses show the entire ministry of our Savior on this earth. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And ladies and gentlemen, if you ain't saved, you're lost. If you're not been found, you're lost. And he came to save you. But my one of my favorites, and I've quoted this so many times in the last little while, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. You ought to write it down. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself a ransom for all. He says no man took his life because he laid it down willingly on Calvary. And that's our Savior. Isaiah shares the Lord's encouragement to his faithful people. You know, it's always good to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's always good to know that even though they were on the wrong road, they got on the right road and had a long way to go, but at least they were on the right road. How many of you have ever been out driving and your GPS took you to the wrong road? <laughs> been there. I don't know where we ended up. We ended up on a frontage road driving from one place to another. And I, and I didn't even see a way to get off of it. And all I was doing was following the GPS. So finally, we got our heads together and we got back on the right road. We were a long way from where we needed to be, but at least we were on the right road. And you know what? That's encouraging to say something like that. Well, at least we're on the right road. People that come visit our church, I often ask them, did you have a hard time finding us? Some folks have, other folks have not. I know uh, one time, one night we had some folks coming here and I uh, uh, remember our old song books and I sold those to whoever wanted them. People came from all over to get them. One family came to our church. They didn't think they would ever get here. And they, I mean, they went on every street, went over this and went over that, went around this sign and this pylon and whatever it was, and finally got here just moments before the evening service started. They bought the book and they drove off, but they got lost on the way here. It's kind of nice. Okay, well, we're on the right road then. Being on the right road is good. And God now assures his people that even though they've been on the wrong road for a very long time, he's going to put them on the right road and make everything the way that it ought to be. And he sent them an encouraging word. I like telling people, this ain't all there is. This world is not my home. I am just a passing through. And my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And what do we often say to people who've had a loss of a loved one? I, I read it on a regular basis because there's a lot of death out there, ladies and gentlemen. It's going around these days quite a bit. But what do many Christians write to other believers? They will say this, thank the Lord for the promise of heaven. This ain't all there is. And you see, they're all expecting me and this one thing I know. And the Lord has been good and the Lord has been great. Aren't you glad that this isn't all there is? This is simply not all there is. Jesus could come back tonight I mean, the truth of the matter is we can't guarantee the next breath uh, and fully on all the false teachers that take away your hope. And I like what Paul wrote. He said, and he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Not a lot of comfort in Jesus not coming back. Not a lot of comfort in not being delivered out of this old sin cursed world. But the Apostle Paul said there's coming a day when the angel's going to shout and the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, you comfort one another with these words and I'm comforted by those words and you ought to be too. So here we have, you know what you might want to do and this is only a suggestion. You're not going to be quizzed on it. You may want to write to the side of the night's notes, John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell. And you may want to go to John 3.16 and put these references here and say the ministry of Christ in a nutshell, which is exactly what it is. And let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heavenly.